Hi, I'm Dave Henning with the Fresh Start Podcast, fresh ideas for business and personal growth. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm super excited to have Jeffrey Klein from the Philadelphia area, and he's got some great things to share with us about stories. He's a TEDx speaker, visual content producer. He's helping lots and lots of people communicate more effectively through the power of story and visual communication. Uh, so I got a lot of uh, bio information on you. We're going to cut right to the chase and say, welcome, Jeffrey. Good to have you here. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate being here. So you've been, you've been, uh, you've been doing this for a while, 25 years. You've uh, spoke at TEDx Lehigh Valley, uh, also at the Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK, Drexel, Hussian Temple University, and you're also an instructor at Temple University. How's that going? Uh, well, semester just ended, so I'm feeling good. It went well. Uh, virtual is a challenge, but I uh, had a great class and um, always impressed that we have a big final project and always impressed with what the students produce. You also have done some stuff with Seth Godin, who I love Seth, known about him and known him for many years. You've done some work with uh, Paramount Pictures and MGM Studios. Tell us about that. Yeah. So Seth was my first real boss. So I graduated from college and uh, he hired me when I was, you know, fresh out of, out of, of school, didn't know much. Uh, he wasn't Seth Godin then, really. Um, <laughs> so I, I was with him, you know, about a year. And then I, I ended up deciding to pursue law, which didn't last very long. Um, I get it. Sure. And, and then several years later, he sold his company for $30 million to Yahoo, went on to write dozens of books and speak. And, but he is, all he is as good as everything he does, and he's really just a phenomenal person and an incredible marketing mind. Really, just as good yeah. as they get. Oh yeah, I think I have the little red book, the little green book. No, uh, yeah, all that, all that stuff. I need another color. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll come out purple. You need a purple book. Yeah. Oh, I like your, I like your, uh, your, your purple backdrop. Awesome. Uh, so what about these what about these uh, movie projects? What's that all about? Yeah, so I, I I had a dream to go work in the film industry. So I was actually in law school. I decided to move to California for my last year. I did my credits at a school in LA. And I started working at, my first job was in the story department at a talent and literary agency where I read a bunch of scripts. And then I went to work for the head of production at Paramount Pictures and then subsequently the head of production at MGM. And I was, you know, the little cog in the machine. Sure. But my boss was actually quite important. And they, we basically helped shepherd projects from once they bought the script all the way through to release of the movie. So I got to see how movies were made from, you know, behind, you know, behind the curtain, as it were. Uh, and it was amazing. It really was a phenomenal experience. I worked on all these movies from, you know, The Truman Show to Legally Blonde to Mission Impossible 2 and, uh, oh. Sleepy Hollow, and it was it was phenomenal, and it was a dream realized. It was. Oh, that is so. That is so cool. <laughs> Very, and it's just interesting. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, <laughs> I I had this little tiny extra part in a George Clooney movie, the Leatherheads movie, and and uh, I, I was like from me to you with, with George there temporarily, uh, and uh, it's a football old football movie, right? But. My point being is what you just said is hundreds and hundreds of people in the credits. If you ever read all the credits of the people involved, to just to make a movie, it's, just, it's fascinating. The what's in what, as you mentioned, uh, what that takes, right? Yeah, and again, it all starts with story. I mean, that's the thing that you know. So yeah. for me, as a person who you know, that's where my passion and my love is. Uh, I was in the thick of that in terms of that's where, you know, ever, I was really lucky. The president of production when I was at MGM had directed a movie, had gone to film school, which is kind of uh, not the normal, typical way of executives. Um, but she writ for her, it was about the story. And so the movies that we produced, okay, maybe not Mission Impossible 2 in terms of the same way, but, you know, because there were certain elements of that kind of film. But for the most part, she was looking to make films that had a story that was going to capture people's attention and connect with them and do all the kinds of things. And so I think I was really fortunate to, to work with someone who really deeply shared that love of, of story and, and of, you know, what is this, you know, so it was always started with the script um, and all the other stuff to bring it to life was, you know, incredibly collaborative with all those different people you mentioned who you see in the credits. Um, but if the story wasn't good, 
to start with, then you're not going to produce anything particularly compelling. Um, and so I've taken that experience and taken it all the way through to what I do now um, and really starting with what's the story you're trying to tell? Who's your audience? You know, what matters to them and all those kinds of things. Well, that was kind of my next question about what was your takeaway? Obviously, a huge takeaway that was a, a great uh, uh, training ground for you, really. And how you how you got into that is uh, is uh, excellent, of course. And now you're using a lot of those skills and knowledge and wisdom from those days. And uh, by the way, I, uh, I loved all the Mission Impossible uh, series, but all, all that to say, even, even, that, uh, even that movie had a lot of intricate storylines with the characters were all very unique. And so it carried, it, I thought it really carried. Yeah. And, and, I, and again, I think I wasn't trying to, to, you know, diminish the story importance in action movies or in those kinds of movies. I think when you say, oh, did you see a movie that had a really good story? Those aren't the ones that people first think about. Right. But there are plenty of bad action movies. And part of the reason they're bad is because they didn't start with a very good story. So I think the ones that we like, <laughs> they have to have all those elements. So they have to be entertaining. But Part of the entertainment is having a story that we follow along and really enjoy. Exactly. I'm kind of chuckling because I occasionally will watch, uh, maybe on Netflix or something, a Steven Seagal B movie. <laughs> I used to love those movies as a, as a kid. Um, Under Siege and all, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Same exact story. And as long as he's breaking somebody's wrist, you know, you're happy. <laughs> well, the thing about Steven Seagal, I don't know, you know, one of the things about those kind of martial arts is, you know, are they really trained and do they? He's the real deal. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a friend who's a martial arts, you know, fanatic, and he was showing me magazines when Steven Seagal, before he was a film star in an Aikido magazine with an Aikido master. Oh, so, wow. I, I, he, he's the real deal. Well, for some odd reason, I decided I need to exercise while I'm going to graduate school to a seminary and I joined, it, joined this dojo. And uh, just for exercise, but the instru but the owner of the dojo was actually inducted into the Martial Arts Hall of Fame with Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee, who are personal friends of his. This guy, can I say, uh, can I say badass? Is that okay to say that? So I, I get you on, on the Steven Seagal stuff. Uh, <laughs> having said that, uh, you've spoken a lot of universities, the science of story. So it's an actual science. 100%. So my, my, the, the keynote that I deliver most often, I call the science of story and it's why story matters. I mean, that's the kind of like, so I, I always say story matters and the science proves it. So here's the story. So there was a professor, a neuroscientist named Uri Hassan, who at the time was at Princeton and he did research. And his, his, his question was, how does our brain behave depending on the input we get? And the two inputs he tested were one group we're getting facts and figures, data. And then the second group, we're getting those same, but they were getting it in a narrative. Someone was telling them a story. Now, the first group that were given those facts, that data points and those things that a lot of businesses share, two parts of their brain activated, the vernix area and the Broca's area. Now, those two parts of your brain are super important because they really enable you to decode the meaning so you understand the words that people are saying. But the second group that were told a story their brain activity was incredibly different and their brains lit up. But the interesting part for me is not only did the different parts of their brain activate, but the parts of their brain activated that they would use if they were experiencing the story themselves. So this vicarious um, element. And, and there's actually a term that he came up with called neural coupling, which is if I tell you a story about me kicking a ball your motor cortex actually activates. If I tell you a story about sweet, fresh baked cookies, your olfactory cortex activates. So that why story is so powerful is because we're tapping into the brain chemistry and people are experiencing from a sensory as well as an emotional level. And so the science proves it. And the result of his experiment was basically that when you tell a story as opposed to just sharing information, your audience is 20 to 40% more likely to understand what you're talking about and remember it. And so as a marketer, I'm like, well, what are we trying to accomplish here? We want people to understand your value. So they have to understand what it is you do. 
and we'd love them to remember you so that, you know, that's why we spend the money so that you see them. And so the best way to communicate, in my opinion, the most effective way is by telling the story. I reference back to a gentleman that I uh, interviewed last year, Nir Bashan out of LA. He wrote a book about creativity. And, you know, I lived in the Silicon Valley for the last eight years where it's all about the data and, and right. And so he, uh, his book was all about balancing the data with the, with the creativity and which is all about story. And uh, so he, uh, he actually worked, uh, Worked in L.A. He had a, a studio. I think he lives in Florida now, but he had a studio there. He worked with Woody Harrelson and Rod Stewart and, a, and some rap artists and stuff. But, yeah, he learned a lot from that. And so I'm kind of plugging his book now here in, in this year as well uh, about the very point that you're making. Uh, I mentioned that when I was starting in sales and in, uh, in radio stations, took myself off the air and telling stories on a microphone. People, my customers, my small business owners really did not care how high, how high the tower was, who was your midday announcer guy or all these facts and figures. They wanted the radio station WIIFM. What's in it for me? <laughs> I reference that one often. You know, I, I've learned over the years that fortunately, because of my background on and off the air and you name it, did everything. It gives me this appreciation for stories. And then, of course, being in the radio business, I have some very hilarious stories that I'll tell you some sometime. <laughs> very memorable, by, by the way. Let me get to some of your questions. You've been an adjunct professor at Temple, uh, the mm -hmm. School of Media and Communications. Um, how's that going? And what's it like? You're doing a lot of uh, online classes, but who, what kind of uh, students are you attracting to, the, to, this, uh, to this particular school? Yeah, so um, the School of Media and Communication covers advertising, PR, um, some, uh, I find, uh, media studies and media production. Uh, so I usually have a, a good mix of people who, yes, they're doing advertising, marketing, but also I find people from, I've had people from the art school, I have people from the business school. Um, my, the course I teach is social media marketing. And so a lot of what we talk about is how do you tell that story in social media? Because that's the way you're communicating. And how do you create those stories that are going to be important? Uh, and which platform? And all the things in terms of trying to develop a campaign and, uh, and ongoing social media content that's going to resonate. Uh, so the students um, that I, I guess I attract are people who are interested in at least having a foundational understanding of social media. Now, some people want to go on and be social media managers. But I think some people recognize no matter what business you're in, you need to understand social media to a certain degree because it's now the mode to which we share and communicate those stories. I interviewed a guy from Philadelphia last year, Scott Aaron, who is he's a LinkedIn expert. And uh, he had some really interesting things to say because I'm a B2B guy. That's why I like to talk to, to you and my other guests who have a lot of things to do with, with that marketplace. And so uh, he, he had some interesting statistics about the differences between Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, as you do as well. Can you mention uh, maybe some of those differences? I got seven Facebook pages. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you it from a more global perspective on story. And, the, and one of the most critical tips for communication and in my class, I refer to it as the 11th commandment. Um, and so I always say, if you don't remember anything else, remember the 11th commandment. The 11th commandment is know thy audience. And so when you talked about WIIFM and what's in it for me, every story really needs to start with your audience and who are you trying to reach. And so in terms of which platforms you should be on, I say every business should ask themselves two questions about any social media platform. Are my customers on there? And is my competition on there? And if the answer is no to both, then maybe that's not the first place you should start. Um, but if your customers are there, you definitely want to be there. Uh, and if your competition's there, it might be. Now, the only uh, wrinkle to that is that you, if your customers are on a platform, but your competition isn't, there's an opportunity. So some people say, well, why should the plumber be on LinkedIn? Well, if there's no other plumbers on LinkedIn, you're going to stand out. And therefore, you have the advantage of being in an uncrowded space. The other thing is though, like you have to recognize what medium works well for you. So 
businesses can't do everything. It can't be everywhere, especially smaller businesses or startups. It's You can't like, oh, I'm going to be on eight different platforms and there's a new one coming every day and how am I going to possibly do that? So I always suggest start with two and do them very well as opposed to try and do more and then you end up being mediocre at all of them. But also you have to consider what is your resources? So what are you good at? If you're good at video, if you're good at you know, writing, if you're good, will depend on which platform. So obviously, you know, visual communication, which is the one I promote, you know, Instagram is a big, you know, is where a lot of people are. TikTok is coming in, you know, with a storm. I don't know that it's as the right platform for B2B. I'm not actively on it, um, but I know people are. I know a lawyer who's crushing it on LinkedIn, on TikTok, and partly because there's no one else there. So that he proves my point. But I guess there's what you do and where you start. And so, you know, the best practice for me is like, start where you know your audience is. If it's B2B, there's no question in my mind that LinkedIn is the best platform for B2B marketing. And it's been proven over and over again. Um, If you're a consumer product, Facebook probably is a good place to start, especially if your demographic is, you know, not, not Gen Z. If anyone older than that, they're probably still on Facebook. And Facebook knows more about you than anybody else. That's right. So you can target in a way that no one else can. That's because they buy it. They pay for your information. <laughs> well, they, you know, there was an article written a number of years ago that said, who knows you better, Facebook or your best friend? <laughs> and, and, and Facebook won because <laughs> they're yeah. tracking your behavior in a way that most people aren't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What you like and what you share and all these things. And it's scary. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the documentary that came out last year, um, The Social Dilemma. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's frightening because there's an element of manipulation um, that's occurring in terms of the fee that you're getting. And, and as a marketer, I, I, I feel the struggle that we don't want to you know, mislead people. The idea behind, and Seth Godin, you know, his... His book that really put him on the map was called Permission Marketing. And the yes, idea behind I have it is that, that book. If, I, if I get your permission to market to you, the, the theory is that you're going to want what I'm, what I'm sharing. You know, when you opt into something, you're like, oh, yeah, I like your content. I want to see more. The problem is that people have taken advantage of that and now they're inundating people. When, what, you know, and then you look at retargeting. I've, retargeting is one of the most fascinating things. I'll go look at a, uh, to buy a fan for the summer. And for the next two weeks, I'm getting fan ads all the time from the company that I may have already bought it from. I'm like, you've already got my money. Why are you wasting your money on me? Yes. So, you know, it's, it, it's um, like all of marketing. It's part art and part science. And that, that was the last piece I wanted to share was because it's science, it requires experimentation. So it's not like, okay, I'm a lawyer. Where should I advertise? Well, you should hear the best practices. Here's what most people say, but you're going to have to test it and see what works for your law firm because you may find because of your particular nature of law that, oh my God, Twitter's king because your audience happens to be there. So it's, but again, I go back to the audience. You start with the audience and find out what stories are going to resonate with them. And that's how you start. It's constant testing really. And one of the things, interestingly, because uh, uh, with the with the with the platform that you found me on, I get lots and lots of requests now. I, I just passed this to you, just just between you and me. Don't tell anybody. But <laughs> but I had a one a one uh, gentleman that I invited to be on my podcast. He he his next question on that platform was, well, how many uh, how many connections do you have? And I'm thinking, well, I could say, uh, actually, as of yesterday, I have 30,000, I have 40,000, uh, but uh, they're not all mine. Don't tell anybody. I, I, got, I answered him, and he didn't reply to get on my show. And I got to thinking, I should have asked back, how many do you need? Be- because it's not this. Some people have been taught this concept that, oh, connect with people with a humongous audience. Well, uh, it's what you said. It's it's not uh, it's not how big the audience is. How many of them are either your competition or your potential customer? You, you could have ten people, and it could be a better a better list. 
than 30 or 100,000 or 200,000 people. It doesn't make any sense. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't take offense because it was a learning thing for me. And I can see you're concurring that, um, look, you just filtered yourself out. You know, right. you, you don't need me. Hey, thanks. Thanks for saving me some time. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in social media in particular, those vanity metrics of likes and fans are really misleading. And what I always say to people is, what matters is engagement. I don't care if you have five fans and there's a book called, I don't remember who wrote it, called Superfan. And they're the people that you really want to cater to because they're the ones who are going to go do your marketing for you because they like your brand so much they're going to be talking about it and they're going to be helping people. And so, yeah, to me, it's not about having X amount of fans. It's about how many fans you have that actually are engaged with your content, are engaged with your brand and are sharing it in ways. Um, I'd much rather have a thousand really engage fans than 10,000 fans who just don't even pay attention. So it's, Oh yeah. Oh, of course. One of those things a lot of people, well, you don't have, now there is social proof. So there is something to the fact that if someone's like, Hey, follow me. And I go and they've got four followers. I might not. Sure. Be as sure. eager if they, Oh, they've got a couple thousand. Yeah. Um, I think the difference is they've got a couple thousand or a couple million. You know, I almost don't want to be with a couple million because yeah. They got, I mean, they got too much noise and too much on there uh, that, you know, you're not going to reach them. And, and there's a digital marketer that I really, that I quote a lot. He wrote a book called Relevance Raises Response. Ah, relevance. And to me, it ties back into knowing your audience so that when you create content, when you tell stories that are relevant to that audience, they're going to engage. And that's to me, is, is the goal. And I like the other R word, relationships. Um, you know, I, I always, in, in all the, I've owned some small businesses and some companies, uh, worked in corporate, you know, worked for myself for years. And uh, it's the relationships that are, make it long-term, right? 100%. And again, I think that's why, and as I like, I like what you said, which is long-term. So if you're looking for a, a cash land grab, you can do a lot of tactics that aren't very ethical and that people don't care about. Um, but if you're looking to build a brand for the long term and you're looking to build a, a sustainable business, relationships are everything. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, because as uh, as you know, as you well know, uh, uh, you already mentioned this, social media, you know, so, oh, I checked how many likes did I get on this? How many, you know, it's meaningless, really. Because we're, we're, quote, friends only in, in name only. <laughs> you've, kind of, you've kind of touched on this. What's the, be what's the best way to communicate with an audience then? I know stories, of course, but expound upon that a little bit. Yeah. So I believe I, I actually will go one step further. So I believe that telling a story is the, e the best way to communicate. And then for me, this is what I do, but I also believe it. And there's plenty of studies and statistics, which is visual storytelling is the most powerful way to tell your story. So I'm like, okay, you want to try and reach people, then tell a story. What's the best way to tell a story is through visual communication. So even though I'm a writer and I like to write, I think that a video, uh, an image, it's just more powerful. And it, people are more likely to click play on a video than they are to read a blog article or a white paper. Um, you know, those things, that, white papers and blogs to me are for SEO so that when people search, they can find you. Uh, but in terms of engaging with people, the engagement is way higher if you're using video or even graphics than if you use just text. Um, and that's my belief that that's the way. And then again, start with your audience. You know, what is the message that's going to matter to them in terms of why they're going to pay attention? Give me a couple of tips for telling better business stories. What would that look like? Yeah. So I, I often share what I call my ABCs of telling stories. So the A is going to be one I've been harping on for you know most of this call, which is, you know, connect to your audience. So who's your audience? What matters to them? What do they care about? What's their pain? You know, what's the problem? Because that's where you want to start your story. Because if you don't address what their issue is, then they're, they're going to not ever pay attention. Uh, so that's the A is your audience. Got to know your audience and back to the 11th commandment. So a B is, you know, we talk about this in terms of vanity metrics and likes and all these kinds of things and friends. Um, I think 
the B for me is be authentic. You, it, transparency is more important than ever. People's BS radar, I like to call it, is higher than ever. Um, so that don't try and be something that you're not. It's because you'll get caught. Um, and so I think, again, people aren't looking for perfection. They're looking for authenticity. They're looking for genuine, you know, and so a lot of times people are like, oh, I can't post this video because it's not perfect. Perfect is not the goal. Perfectly authentic is the goal. And so even if you're grabbing your cell phone and recording it without perfect lighting and perfect audio, some of those videos work really well. There's a time and place, I think, for, you know, productions to have good productions. But my feeling is share your story in all different ways, making sure that you're speaking to your audience. And I always mention this, which is if I want to be 100% authentic, which I always want to be, the B of the story tip really should be another A because it's really about authenticity. Um, but B authentic just fit better with my ABC. So I hope you'll forgive that and let, let that slide. <laughs> That's um, good. That's good stuff. <laughs> and then the C for me is about that connection connecting to your audience in two powerful ways. And it's, again, goes back to that science of story. One is about that sensory. So you can connect by making sure that your stories are actually giving the opportunity for that part of their brain to activate. So how you describe things and the ways uh, that people can interact and experience the story. And the second way is the emotional one. So one thing is about when people tell you a story, there's actually a rise in your oxytocin level, which is that love hormone. And so when you're telling a story, it's immediately getting to our emotional core. And that's why you relate to people and you connect with people. So you want to think about the emotions that you're trying to evoke in the story that you're telling. And again, if you start with the audience, you start with what matters to them, their pain, you're halfway there. Uh, so those are the kind of ABCs, you know, your audience, you know, authenticity and, you know, connect to them emotionally and sensory. My uh, my golfing buddy back in Charlotte, North Carolina, when I lived there, um, actually um, recruited me into his insurance agency uh, back before 2008 when everything changed. I was doing life and health and retirement stuff, and I had my mortgage license. But I, I mentioned that to, to say that uh, he had a little policy when he was talking to people. He, you know, he him and his business partner were what I call, uh, I guess I can say this, Aflac refugees and decided to st start their own agency that they built to a, I mean, it's a humongous hundreds and hundreds of agents they have regionally in the, in the eastern, eastern side of the United States. But he, when people would come into his office to see him, he's, he would always tell, tell me or tell people, I have a BS meter in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I, love that. I learned some other little interesting interesting things on how to compliment compliment people <laughs> you, you know i think you can buy those on amazon now bs meters <laughs> see somebody's going to go out and invent one now that i said that right and and sell and make make a million bucks and then and then sell it to uh, google or somebody <laughs> do you have any tools to help people tell their story to really, really engage with their potential customers. Yeah, this is a very practical tool. And I think it's it, it kind of piggybacks on the ABC that I was talking about. So one of the things is uh, you want to start with the tried and true. And I came from the film business. Uh, but well before there was any movies around, there was storytelling and there was a structure to it. You know, the three-act structure, you know, Aristotle came up with it um, in 350 BC. So it's been around a little bit. A little so bit. I really tell people that they should really use it because we're hardwired to want to have that kind of flow to a story. And so we came up with a tool that's really easy for any business to tell their story. And I call it the story pad, P-A-D. And the P-A-D represent the beginning, the middle, and the end of your story. So the P I just referenced a moment ago. What is the P? Where do you start your story? With the pain or the problem of your audience. That's where we start. And I'll give you an example when I finish all three of how you include these. So what's the A? Well, they have a pain and you know they have a problem and you've got your product or service is the answer. So I have a pain and the A is the answer that you provide. Now, a lot of businesses stop there. They're like, you got a problem and we have the answer. But the D in the story pad, which is the end of your story, I think is really powerful. And the D stands for the difference it makes in that person's business or life. That's the impact. So you're looking to show 
not just that you can solve a problem, but what is the result of doing so. So I'll give you an example. Um, personal injury lawyers are some that actually do a pretty good job in telling their story in a very succinct way. And so I use them as an example, plus of my, my legal background. But you've probably seen this on a bus or in the magazines or the subway. Have you been injured in an accident? That's where they start the problem. So that if you're their audience and you've, in fact, been injured in an accident, you're going to pay attention. Yeah, I've been injured in an accident. So immediately they're hooking you. And that's what you need to do. You know, find a way to hook your audience. So that's the P, the problem. Have you been injured in an accident? Now you get to the A. Don't worry. The law offices of David and Jeffrey can help solve your problems. And so you just come in free consultation. And so they come and so there's the answer, legal services that can help them. And then the D is what happens when you engage us? We'll get results. We'll get you compensation for your pain, suffering, loss. So you have the problem, you've been injured in an accident, the solution, our services, our legal services, and the difference, you will be made whole, you will get the compensation, you'll be able to pay your bills, to live a better life, all of those things that are really important. And that's, you can use that formula for any business. Start with what the pain or problem is of your, you know, how do you help them? Well, you think about how you help by what is their problem and your product or service is the answer. And then what is the impact and the difference that it makes? The story pad. P-A-D, problem, action, difference. Problem, answer, difference. An oh, answer, but that does involve action. Take, take action, <laughs> yeah. Yes, definitely. Well, uh, I had a, a gentleman that I highly admired years ago, uh, and, and he had a he had a saying: uh, "Find a problem and solve it. Find a hurt and heal it." Robert Schuler. I love his uh, writings. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm not I'm not ever claiming that I that what I'm saying is you know an epiphany, because this is what everyone should be thinking about. But what I'm trying to do is give an easy structure for people. Keep it simple. People are always overcomplicating things. And so I'm trying to give you a quick tool. Oh, the story pad, problem, answer, difference. You know, and that way, when you're starting any kind of business, you can plot it in. And it, it is a great tool. We use a lot when we're doing animated videos in terms of the story we're going to tell. So, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, you actually stole this from some guy in 380 BC. <laughs> Hey, you know, you got to use I think the copyright or trademark has been passed on. Yeah. Since then. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know that the uh, the difference between research and plagiarism. <laughs> um, plagiarism is when you steal it from one guy. Research is when you steal it from ten guys. <laughs> I'm a big fan of research. <laughs> right, I get that totally. Well, so you that's the format that you just shared with me. Uh, that was one of the questions: is the format, which is PAD. Uh, problem, answer, the difference. difference, which is, I got that mixed up with results. Yeah. So that's P-A-R. That's a golf term. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll... So how can I help you? I, uh, I've been really uh, blessed to talk with you, Jeffrey. I'm speaking with Jeffrey Klein. Uh, TEDx speaker, and he's got some lot of great practical things for any of us, and which is most of us are involved using social media in some way. How can I help you today? Is there a particular website that I could uh, put on here and help yeah, our listeners there's, connect? I'll give you three because you know you want to have a beginning, middle, and end. So I'll give you the ABCs of it. So uh, as a speaker, and I always am looking to speak to conferences and things like that, is my, my name, ggkline.com. That's where you can find about my speaker, the topics I talk about, find my TEDx talk itself. Uh, the second one is I'm a visual content producer. So if you're looking to create particularly animation for your business, that's ninedotsmedia.com. That's my content company. And the final one is I have a podcast. And so I love people to check it out. Uh, it's something that I, I get to interview people and what we were basically, it's called Connect the Dots. You can find it at ninedotspodcast.com. And it, I interview people who are much more successful than me so we can listen to their story and follow the journey of how they connected the dots. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And so one final question. What was the first job you had when you were a kid? I asked that question in my podcast. Ah, you see, uh, research. <laughs> yeah. So I guess technically it would it would be 
shoveling snow would be one. But the first one where I actually went to a job because I was kind of a soft star was I worked in a bakery. Um, oh. And I got up really early in the summer and I went and, and I love baking to this day. Um, so yeah, I am a closet baker. Uh, now, was that in the Philly area? Philadelphia? Oh, because, oh my gosh, so much great food and bakeries. Oh my, I'm sp- I'm waiting for Apple to invent smell o vision for my computer because I'm it's talking about, talk about sensory. I'm smelling it right now. I'm not kidding. Or that yeah, could well, be something I'll, I'll else. I'll tell you one funny thing. So my first boss at the bakery, true story, her name was Cookie. Uh, <laughs> another memory hook. <laughs> well, Jeffrey, this has been delightful. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm Dave Henning. My guest has been Jeffrey Klein. Uh, Fresh Start Podcast, fresh ideas for business and personal growth. Thanks for joining us.